I want to look at another example of where Schofield, in his notes, uses this term local church, um, but it doesn't actually appear in the scripture. It appears in the study Bible, um, but it does not appear in the actual scripture. Um, remember, when you're dealing with the study Bible, the author or the uh, commentator's notes are not inspired. They're his uh, own beliefs, his own notes, um, but they do not come from God as the actual scripture does. So something I, I want to look at um, here in another example. I want you to go ahead and turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I want to look at verse 17. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. All right, the word of God says, But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. Amen. Great piece of scripture there. Uh, chapter 7 is a, is a great chapter uh, to read in its entirety. Um, but the reason I wanted to look at this specific scripture is when you look at that last word, in all churches. Okay, obviously what Paul is talking about here are the bodies of believers, the bodies of Christ. Um, there's the body of Christ, and then there's the, the assemblies, or the congregations, if you will, of saved believers. And that's what he's talking about here in this letter to the Corinthians, the church of Corinth. But, um, when you look at the study Bible, what it's got in the text is it'll have these um, letters. It'll, it'll have these little letters, and they correspond to references. So, you look at this, and you say, okay, well, I'm going to look at that verse, and there's two letter S's. So you go and you look in the, the center column here where the reference are, and they're right next to every man, and he has it as meaning each. Okay, fine. Um, but that's not what the Word of God says, right? Um, he's adding to that here. And again, I don't believe he's doing it intentionally in the sense that Schofield was some kind of Satanist. I'm just saying this can be misinterpreted by somebody who's not familiar with the Scripture. Um, but what I, but the main point I wanted to make here is if you look at the word S, then you look at the word T, and um, and the word T is right before that last part. So let me read the verse again, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It says, But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. He's got a little letter T next to those last three words, in all churches. So you look in the reference, and you see what he means by that. And what he says here is, he puts the word churches, and then in parentheses, he puts local. So he's got churches, just like the scripture does, so it matches the scripture, it matches the, the God-breathed word of God. Um, but then next to it, in, the, in these parentheses, he's got local. So, somebody who doesn't know the issue that church buildings are not scriptural, and that it's a perversion of scripture, would look at this and say, wow, well, you've got churches, and then you've got local here. Well, hmm, the Bible's telling me I need to belong to a local church, which is absurd. But again, people who pervert the word of God will use something like this to to draw away disciples after them, so to speak, to get people in their building so they'll worship them. Because that's really what you do in a church building. You worship your pastor. You don't worship the Lord because the Lord's not there. And we're going to see that here in a little while. Um, it's absurd. Uh, so again, and just another example there of, of adding to the word of God, of putting local where it doesn't need to be. You know, just, just leave it alone. It's the Word of God. It's by its own. It doesn't need your expertise. Um, I want to look at another example here. In, stay in 1 Corinthians. And I want to look at chapter 14. And in chapter 14, this actually doesn't appear in the reference. This appears in the actual scripture. It, it appears between two verses. It's pretty interesting. And you'll see in a study Bible, you'll have, um, for instance, this is chapter 14. And it says chapter 14, just like this, the, the Bible would say. It, but then the scriptures are broken up into pieces. So it's uh, scripture, let's say, or verse rather, 1 through 20, or, or in front of verse 1 rather, through 22. He has chapter 14, and then he has prophecy is the greatest gift of the gifts. Okay, that's his wording. So chapter 14, prophecy is the greatest gift of, of the pro prophecy is the greatest of the gifts. And then verse 1. So in between chapter 14 and verse 1, he adds his title. That's not God's title. That's not God breathed. That's C.I. Schofield's opinion. Okay? That's a problem. But let's look at the, the main part I want to look at, which is between verses 22 and 23. So after verse 22, he divides up this chapter 
from, from verses 23 to 40 in chapter 14, he, in, he titles this, he titles this, not God, so you have to understand what I'm talking about here. He titles this, the order of the ministry of gift in the local church. Again, the order of the ministry of gift in the local church. He adds local church in there. That's not scripture. That's his title. So again, if you're not to, to the untrained eye, I guess you could say, to somebody who's not used to the scripture, who doesn't who doesn't read the Bible, who again is just starting out, you can see that and go, Wow, local church is in the Bible again. Man, I better belong to a local church. I I've heard some some preachers say that you don't need to belong to local churches. There been there because there are plenty of good Bible believing ministries that preach the truth that there's no such thing as a church building and it's all nonsense and lies. Um, but then you see the world, you know, because church buildings are of the world, right? They're of Satan. They're for lost people. Let's be honest. And again, I'm not saying everybody in one is lost, but they're created. They're designed for lost people. They're designed to lure in lost people to give them false religion to get them in their system to control them. So a lost person, you know, or I'm sorry, a, a newly saved person sees this and they don't know a lot. You know, they're just on milk. You know, they're not on that meat doctrine yet. And they go, wow, local church. Well, maybe Rick Warren's right. Maybe Joe Osteen's right. Maybe these other people are right. Because they don't have enough scripture knowledge to know that they're hirelings, that they're ministers of Satan, that they're not the Lord. See, they don't understand that yet, which is fine. I didn't understand it either. Um, you know, you might, if you look back in my... Um, my videos, please watch them. Um, I belonged to a few local churches, quote unquote, when I first got saved because I thought that's where you went to learn the Bible, which is absurd. People in churches don't really know the Bible or they wouldn't be in the church because it's not in the Bible. But anyway, um, so again, he adds this title in between the verses here, um, and that can be very confusing. So the term local church does not appear in the Bible. You will not find local church in the Bible anywhere. It does not appear. But it's been added. Now again, I don't think C. I. Schofield did it as a, you know, as some type of a satanic reason. Um, I'm just saying that he puts that in his study Bible, and people who don't know Scripture see that, and they hear what the world says, and they think, okay, I need to go to a church building, which is absurd. So again, um, just wanted to go through that to show that first example. Um, now I want to look at a few scriptures that do talk about the building and show. And there's many of these, by the way. I couldn't possibly go through all of them. Um, it would be a multi-part video, and I'm trying to contain this to two or three parts. So um, you can look it up on your own. You can look up the word church. You can look up the word temple, the word building, all these different words, and you won't find any connection to the modern-day church building. That's very easy to find if you're willing to search the scriptures. Um, let's go ahead and look at the book of Acts. And I want to look at Acts chapter 17. And in Acts chapter 17, I want to look at verse 27. Acts chapter 17 verse 27 says that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one. Wait a minute here. Let me see. I think I might have written down the wrong verse. Oh! I'm sorry. Um, let's go ahead then and look that, I'm sorry, it was verse 24. I'm sorry, chapter 17, verse 24. I was reading it. Um, verse 24 says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made of hands. Pretty clear scripture. God doesn't dwell in buildings. He doesn't dwell in temples um, made of hands. And obviously, um, this isn't just talking about um, temples as in um, the the uh, the Jewish temple or the synagogue, this is talking about buildings in general. Remember, Acts is a transitional book um, as part of the New Testament, the history book of the New Testament. So, what is being written here uh, by Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is that God does not dwell in these temples. Um, God made the world and everything. And just think about it. God made everything. He made the world. He created everything. Why would you try to fit him into a little church building? I mean, it's absurd to think that God who's everywhere, all the time, knows everything, is in a building? It's just, it, it really it shows pride and arrogance that you think you can build a building and host God as if he's going to come into your ridiculous building. It's absurd. Um, but again, it's a very clear scripture. It shows that. Um, let's go ahead and look then to at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want to look at verse 9. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 says, 
For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Again, Paul writes this epistle to, to the uh, church of Corinth, to the Corinthian people, and he's saying, you are the building. There is no building, right? You are you are the, the building of God together as the body of Christ. So again, another clear scripture that says that you are God's building. He's talking to Christians here. He's talking to the church of Corinth. Um, so again, another clear scripture. Let's go ahead and stay in that chapter, in, in chapter 3, and I'm going to look at verses um, 16 and 17. So chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defileth the temple of God, he, sh he him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. If you're watching this and you're saved, you are the temple of God. Not the building. Okay? Um, Brother Brian Denlinger does excellent videos on this. I, I'm not going to get into it here. It's not my calling, but he does great videos on the fact that church buildings aren't scriptural. I encourage you to watch those if you want to know more. He goes through a lot more scriptures than I'm going to go through here in this study. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But my point is, let's review it again. Verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If you are saved, you are the temple of God, and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The Holy Spirit is not in a church building. And if you've ever attended one, and you're truly saved, you will know the Holy Spirit is not in that church building. Now, it might be in you. If you are saved, and you go into the church building, well, the Holy Spirit obviously goes with you. But it's not in the building. And you'll see that, because you'll see all the wickedness, you'll see the carnality, you'll see the worldliness, you'll see all these people that profess Jesus and call themselves Christians, but they're not Christians. They have no, no connection to, to the people in the Bible and to what the Bible teaches. And they're embracing satanic false doctrine instead of what the Bible teaches. Um, so again, just another example there. Let's go ahead and look at 2 Corinthians. So go next over to 2 Corinthians and look at chapter 6, verse 14. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And let's read through verse 18. Okay, 2 Corinthians 6, 8, 14 through 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? This is a scripture that completely obliterates the current church, which says all are welcome. You know, everybody come, saved and lost, come together and worship. Um, I'm also working on a video called Satan's Community Church. The idea of community churches is satanic. It's completely contrary to the Bible. Why do they do that? Because they want your money. Because very few Christians, there are very few Christians around, I mean, and that's not enough money to support their lifestyle. They need you to support them in their, in their multi-million dollar buildings. So they need lost people. Lost people tend to have more money, right, because they're more worldly. Um, so they need that, that income. So they say, oh, all are welcome. And I used to think that. I mean, I used to think all were welcome in the church of God and this kind of nonsense until I started reading the Bible and going, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible very clearly teaches that people who are unsaved do not belong with people who are saved. There's no fellowship. You can't have fellowship with lost people. So let's keep reading. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Yeah, very clearly. Paul's writing this. What part do you have if you are a believer? What part do you have? What business do you have sitting next to a lost person worshiping the Lord when they don't even believe in the Lord? They don't love the Lord Jesus Christ. They hate Him. That's why they're lost, right? And you bring Him into your church building? It's blasphemous. It's ridiculous. It's, it's completely contrary to Scripture. It, it, it's, it's just a joke. It's absurd. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Very clear, right? Very clear from verse 16 what God is saying. What business do you have in this idolatry, this church building that you're worshiping? And that's what you do when you go to a church building. Like it or not, people, you are worshiping that building. You're worshiping the hireling pastor who doesn't belong up there, and you're worshiping the building. Why don't you go meet somewhere else? Why don't you meet in homes like the Christians actually did in the Bible and actually should be doing today? Why don't you go meet in nature somewhere? Why don't you go meet in a forest or in a park or somewhere else? Why do you have to meet in the temple? Why do you have to meet in the building? Because you think that's where God is. And it's absurd. It's not. 
Um, verse 11. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So again, God's not only saying, what business do you have with lost people? Don't get yoked up with them. He's giving you a commandment here. Come out from among them. Get out of your lost church building. It's not of the Lord. If you are saved, get out of it. And I've done it, and I know it's hard, and I've lost family members from doing it. I've lost friends from doing it. But you know what? The Lord Jesus Christ tells us you have to be willing to do those things to follow Him and to be a disciple of His. It's not easy. My wife and I lost a lot of family and friends when we've left church buildings. Tons. Um, and that's fine. We realized they weren't saved anyway, so it made no difference. Um, but the point is, this is a commandment. Come out from among them. Get out of the lost church building. It's wicked and not of the Lord. Anyway, that's another study. Um, so I just wanted to look at those scriptures to kind of go into what the building really is. You are the building. You are the body of Christ. Uh, not the, the temple with the cross on top. Um, it's absurd. Now I want to look at another example in here. So the first example is the term local church. The next example I want to look at is a term that Schofield actually adds in his reference notes to the Bible. Um, he calls it a deaconess. And now if you look in the Bible, there's no term deaconess in the scripture because deacons are men, they're not women. But he adds this term. And, it's, and again, to the untrained eye, to somebody who's not been saved, you could read this and think, wow, Women are supposed to be deacons, I guess, because the Bible teaches that. They might as well be pastors too, right? So um, we're going to look at that. So let's look at Romans. Book of Romans. And I want you to look at the last chapter here where Paul's, um, you know, he's kind of just saying things to people, praising the saints, that sort of a thing. He's wrapping up. Chapter 16 is the last chapter in Romans. Let's look at, at verse 1 here. So in verse 1 in Romans, Paul says, I command unto you, Phoebe, our sister which is a servant of the church, which is at Kinkria. So he says, I commend unto Phoebe, verse 1, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Kinkria. Nothing wrong with that. This, he's talking to Phoebe. She's a sister, right? Every Women that are saved are our sisters in Christ, just like men are our brothers in Christ. Absolutely scriptural. Nothing wrong with it. She's a servant of the church. Okay? The church being the body of Christ. Yes, women can absolutely be servants of the church. They can't be pastors, they can't teach the scripture, but they can be servants of the church in other ways. They can help out the body of Christ in other ways. Absolutely, completely scriptural. Um, but here's the problem, okay? So he says that in the church which is at Kinkria. Um, now, let's look at what, if you look at the scripture, what the scripture says is absolutely accurate. But again, Schofield puts in letters, and you match them to the references, and he adds ideas to them. So let's look at his reference here, if he's got. Um, right in front of the word servant, so servant of the church, he's got a little letter S. And when you go into the reference column, which is usually in the center of your study Bible or your reference Bible, it says, this is Schofield's word, lit, dot, which I, I assume means liter literally, probably, um, is what he's trying to say, like it literally means this, deaconess. So what he's saying is that this servant, that, that Paul's talking about, Phoebe, the sister of the Lord, is not a servant of the church. No, no. She's a deaconess. Now we know, and we're going to look at the scriptures, that to be a deacon you have to be a man. There's a very specific set of scriptures that gives you the outline of the requirements to be a deacon. The word deaconess does not appear in the Bible. But Schofield is saying that the word servant means deaconess. And we know that that's ridiculous. You can be a servant of the church and not be somebody who holds an office of a deacon or who's a bishop. Um, you can serve the church of the Lord in many ways. You can tract. Um, you can go online and make comments on, on, on false doctrine. Um, you can obviously um, witness to people as being a sister in the Lord. You can assist a, a, a brother who's doing ministry. You know, if your husband's in ministry and he's preaching, you can assist him with things, sure. With looking up scriptures, with with praying, with, with you know, being supportive to him. Nothing wrong with that. But you can't teach the scripture. So, this is a serious problem, in my opinion. So you look at that word deaconess, and he's adding that. The word deaconess, again, does not appear in scripture. So what I want to do is I want to look at the scripture that describes what a deacon is. So 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm sorry, let's go forward here. Uh, 1 Timothy 
chapter 3, and this is where Paul gives you the description of what a bishop has to be, the requirements, and what a deacon is. And it's deacon, not deaconess, like princess, right? No, not right. So, let's look at chapter 3, verse 8 through 13. Let's listen to what Paul says here. Uh, 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 18. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to too much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved. Then let them use the, the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree, and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. Very clearly, Paul is saying that a deacon is a man. It's not something I'm going to spend a lot of time on because it's not something that's arguable. It's ridiculous. A deacon is a man, not a woman. Okay? Um, that's just a scriptural fact. But when you add in and say, oh, wait a minute, she's not a servant, she's a deaconess. A deacon is an office holder. There are people that serve the Lord who don't hold any type of an office, who don't lead a congregation, let's say, who aren't a bishop, who aren't an elder, who aren't an overseer. But you can serve the Lord in other ways besides that. And and there are great sisters in the Lord that do wonderful a wonderful job with that. Um, but the way Schofield's wording it, it's implying that you can be a deacon when you're a woman, and you absolutely cannot. So that is unscriptural. So, again, just another example there of what I'm talking about. Now I want to look at my third example here, and this is my last example. And this is going to be found on page 1289 of my, again, my study Bible. And this is the part um, right before Paul, or, or excuse me, Paul, right before the Bible gets into this last part of, of the, the scriptures um, in what some might call the general epistles. Okay, it starts with Hebrews, and then, you know, you end up going through um, Revelation, which, you know, obviously is a, is a prophetic book. But he calls it the Jewish Christian epistles. That's what he calls it here. This is his name for it. People have other names for it. Fine. That's not necessarily my problem. Um, my problem comes when he starts describing the books of First and Second Peter, and he makes them Catholic, which, again, Roman Catholicism, I've said this in other videos, it's the biggest satanic cult on the planet. It's not of the Lord. You cannot find it in Scripture. I'm not going into a lot of detail here. There's no scriptural support for Roman Catholicism. It's a satanic cult. But Schofield gives the impression that Catholicism is Christianity. And I have a serious problem with that because it is not Christianity. Um, so if you look at page 1289, um, there's a whole description. It says the Jewish Christian epistles as he calls them. And it's this new section of the book. Um, he, right after Philemon, if you turn the page in the, in the study Bible, he goes right into this section. He's describing it. starts out with Hebrews. Um, but what he says here is very telling. I mean, you have to really look at what he says. So let me start out by reading here. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, Schofield says, the two epistles of Peter, however, so he's, he's describing each book in this section, and now he's to the epistles of Peter, are less Jewish and more truly Catholic than the other Jewish Christian writings, he calls them. Okay? Um, that is very telling, okay? because what he's saying is that the epistles of Peter um, aren't Jewish, but they're Catholic. And the interesting thing about that is Roman Catholicism teaches that Peter was Pope Peter, the first Pope of Rome, which again is absurd. The Bible doesn't teach that. Okay, Peter was the apostle to the Jews. Um, he was he was in Jerusalem. Okay, he wasn't ever he wasn't in Rome. I mean, it's ridiculous to, to make that connection. Peter was not a Pope. Okay, he was not a Catholic. Um, you only find that in Roman Catholic teachings. You won't find that in the Bible. The word Pope's not even in the Bible. It's absurd. The concept isn't even there. But the point is. He's, he's saying here that these writings of 1st and 2nd Peter are Catholic, which is, again, absurd. Um, and this is not scripture, this is Scofield. Um, so then what I want to do is, I want you to, I want you, or I want to, rather, not you, but me, go ahead and turn to the book of 1st Peter, and I want to show you, in the beginning of the book, he gives a description. And listen to what he writes in this description. It's very interesting. So again, he's saying these are Catholic. These aren't Jewish books, these are Catholic books. Listen to what he says. 
So I'll go ahead and start out in what he calls the theme of the book. Um, and Schofield writes, While Peter undoubtedly has scattered Jewish believers in mind, his epistles comprehend Gentile, comprehend Gentile believers also. The present epistle written from a church on Gentile ground presents all the foundational truths of the Christian faith with special emphasis on the atonement. The distinctive note of 1 Peter is preparation for victory over suffering. The last named word occurs about 15 times and is the key word of the epistle. So he's saying that this epistle is Catholic, right? That's what he said in the description of, of the books. Now listen again. Listen to what he says very clearly. This is Schofield. This is not the scripture. Schofield writes, The present epistle, which is written to the church of the Gentile ground, presents all the foundational truths of the Christian faith. So again, the book of 1 Peter is a Catholic book, according to Schofield, and it presents the foundations of Christianity. So obviously Catholics must be Christians, right? Wrong. They're not Christians. Okay? Roman Catholicism is just ancient Baal worship. Look in the Old Testament. I'm not going to get into it here. But read the Old Testament. It's just copying from Baal worship. And then, of course, it pillages a little bit from, from Judaism, from Christianity, from Islam, a lot from Islam. Um, and it's, it, it's occultism. It's witchcraft. It's Satanism. It's nonsense. But what Schofield is saying is that the epistle of 1 Peter is Catholic, but it's a Catholic epistle that contains the foundations of Christianity, which is absurd. So, again, I just wanted to present those um, to you. Um, just those three examples. There's a ton of examples if you look. And I just want to finish with one more scripture here. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Um, and in this epistle, um, it, or in this uh, scripture rather, it says that God's not the author of confusion. And we know that from the Bible. God does not present things in the Bible to confuse the believer, to confuse his children. If you're saved, you're part of the body of Christ, you're one of the Lord's children. If you're not, you're a child of the devil. So, when you add things to the Bible, and you add in things in the study Bible, like Schofield's done, it's confusing. Now, I don't think Schofield, again, is satanic. I think he was saved. But the point is, it can be confusing to people. And God is not the author of confusion. So, um, I hope that you have enjoyed this study. Again, I, I just, you know, I felt the Holy Spirit's leading to present this, because I've been, I've been using the study Bible. I don't read the study uh, notes. But I felt the Holy Spirit's leading to do that, and he showed me some examples of this. And there's plenty more. I could go into probably a 50-part study on the perversions of study Bibles, the way they add and take away from Scripture. So, again, I hope you enjoyed this study. As always, I hope it was a blessing to you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.